The story you are about to hear may contain detailed descriptions of intense violence and horror. It will certainly be worse than fiction. Hello, I'm Mr. G, and this is the Worse Than Fiction Podcast. Thank you for joining me as we take a look at a horrific tale of real events. In this story, we'll hear the tale of James Urban Rupert, a 41-year-old man living with his mother after a lifetime of failure at being a contributing member of society who left a legacy of horror that should never be forgotten. You see, James was very good at one particular thing, and it would leave a stain on his family and in a house that sits on the 600 block of Minor Avenue in Hamilton, Ohio. A stain that is still visible to this day. This story is very local to me. In fact, I live six or so blocks away from the house where it took place. I've walked, driven, and rode by this house many, many times in the 22 plus years I've lived in this town. I remember when I moved here from my small hometown in southeast Kentucky. One of the first people I became friends with here asked me if I had ever heard of the Rupert House. Of course, being from about 200 miles or a three and a half hour drive away, and having not even been born at the time it occurred, I hadn't heard of this case. However, since our family came to Hamilton, Ohio, we spent most of our time living within a 15 minute walk from the house where James Rupert committed the ultimate act of betrayal upon his own family. I'm kind of a black sheep among most of the circle of friends I grew up with, being the only one who is deeply interested in true crime stories, conspiracy theory, terrible environmental accidents, and horrific man-made disasters. I've been fascinated with this stuff since I was of a single-digit age. I remember watching Unsolved Mysteries when I was very young and being just as glued to the TV as I would with a good cartoon. I don't fully understand my utter immersive fascination with these subjects, but there it is. I have to be perfectly honest with you here. There is very little audio or video footage surrounding this case. I've done everything I can to write a story that is hopefully interesting, accurate, and doesn't toil around with rabbit holes too much, though I will inject a bit of my own opinions in certain areas. For the most part, it'll only be small quips, so without further ado, let's get into the topic of the first episode of Worse Than Fiction. I hope you enjoy, if that's the right word for it. Imagine this with me for a few moments. It's Easter Sunday, a Christian holiday with a long tradition of families getting together, sharing a feast, kids hunting Easter eggs, adults catching up with each other. You're in the kitchen, preparing sandwiches for your eight grandchildren, chatting with your daughter-in-law while your oldest son is sitting at the table reading the newspaper. It's late afternoon and your youngest son, who had moved back in with you at 40 years old, finally emerges from his bedroom after sleeping off a late night of hard drinking. He and his brother strike up a short conversation on the stock market, and at some point the older brother asks how the younger brother's Volkswagen is doing. The younger brother doesn't respond to the question, instead stating that he's going to the target range for some shooting practice. So he goes upstairs to get his guns and ammo. When he comes back down, he sets his rifle up against the refrigerator pulls a 22 caliber pistol and opens fire. March 29th, 1934. A baby boy is born to mother, Charity Rupert, and father, Leonard Rupert Sr. This is the second born child of this young, blossoming family. They were already parents of a boy, Leonard Jr., a toddler at the time of James Urban Rupert's arrival. Ultrasound technology had yet to be realized at this point in history, coming to fruition about 10 years after James was born, so the Ruperts, as all expecting parents before them, didn't know whether their baby would be a male or female. Charity had desperately hoped to have a girl, but was sorely disappointed when the baby that had been born turned out to be male instead. 
She never kept this fact from James as he was growing up, often reminding him that she had wished he was female instead. James had to deal with this for much of his life, the feeling that he was never wanted. The disappointment was exacerbated by the fact that this was a young man that never excelled in anything he attempted, and Charity and Leonard Sr. made sure he understood his place within the family. He had failed them by simply being born. It's heartbreaking when you think about it, a young child who barely knows how to tie his shoes has to deal with parents who remind him all too often that he was a mistake, that he should never have existed. It's an understatement to say that James didn't really know what being a loved member of the family felt like growing up. Leonard Sr. was an emotionless father, and it shouldn't be a shocking revelation to those of us who grew up hearing the stories of kids who had a tyrannical father back in the middle decades of the 20th century. In those days, dad was the be-all, end-all of the family. This kind of fatherhood was all too common in those days, whether anyone liked it or not. Interestingly, this is a familiar thread among some of the worst people that have ever existed. A broken family, dad wasn't there, mom didn't care, abuse, neglect. All stories told often by murderers and serial killers. Unfortunately, James's upbringing was no exception. Dad goes to work to provide the paycheck, comes home, and drinks until he passes out. Mom cleans, cooks, and takes care of household affairs. The typical family of that era. In this case, though, Mom gives no love to the younger boy either. She instead reminds him often of how he was supposed to be a girl never holding back these feelings, and it would wear on James day in, day out. Leonard Sr. wasn't particularly successful in life, yet his presence was dominant. He was violent and always showed a preference for Leonard Jr. He made sure that little Jimmy knew that there was no pride to be had in the young boy. There was no encouragement from this man, only shame and a void of confidence that James would ever amount to anything. Perhaps he was right, but a little bit of encouragement from a parent to a child can go a very long way in helping build self-esteem. Maybe Jimmy would have turned out differently if he had only been shown a bit of love from his parents. Throughout his childhood, Jimmy, as he would be called by those around him, was always one of the smaller kids as an adult, Jimmy stood at 5 feet 6 inches tall, depending on his shoes, and weighed in at a paltry 135 pounds, or a little over 60 and a half kilos for those of you who speak metric. I've also seen it reported that he stood 5 foot 4 inches and 5 foot 5 inches, so I'm not 100% sure on this, but either way, he would be well below average size. Simply taking a look at photos of him being escorted by police will give you an idea of his below average size. I'll post a pic or two on the Facebook page. His childhood stature was certainly much less pronounced, and I'd wager that it goes without saying he would have been considered a runt by any stretch of the imagination. He was never athletic or in any sense noteworthy to any of his classmates in school growing up. Jimmy was a smart kid and as far as that went in the middle of the 20th century, probably considered a nerd for it. In today's society, being a nerd isn't necessarily seen as a flaw in character, but in the 40s and 50s, a nerd would have been picked on relentlessly by the kids who were handsome, outgoing, good at sports, sociable. All traits that Jimmy didn't possess. His father, Leonard Sr., never encouraged Jimmy, instead rearing a tyrannical, abusive head throughout his life. Leonard never showed love or any kind emotion toward either of his sons, never went out to play catch, didn't take them fishing, or teach them how a man should provide for his family, as many respectable fathers would in that era. Leonard Sr. was not a respectable father. July 29, 1946. Leonard Sr. dies unexpectedly at the young age of just 37 from tuberculosis-related issues when Leonard Jr. was 14 and James was 12 years of age. After Leonard Sr. passes, 
The traditional role of man of the house now falls on one of his sons, and it's a role that Leonard Jr. embraces. Like father, like son, they say. So Leonard Jr. picks up where his dad left off and continues the abuse on young Jimmy. I'm sure old dad would be proud. Jimmy would later tell psychiatrists that his brother would pick on him, often tying him up, lashing him with the water hose, locking him in the closet or pinning him down and sitting on his head. It didn't help Jimmy was an unhealthy child, sickly and weak. Easy pickings for bullying, and he got that not only from his brother, but from other kids as well. He was meek in stature and suffered from asthma, and his demeanor was timid. He wasn't allowed to participate in phys ed in school, and couldn't participate in sports. The deck was stacked against little Jimmy, and given the events that would take place later, I still can't help but feel sorry for this poor kid. He never stood a chance from the very beginning. I can relate to Jimmy on some level. Though I wasn't sickly or limited by physical ailments, I too was an introvert, preferring to spend a lot of time in solitude, left to my own thoughts while diving into a good video game or book. There's nothing wrong with that, and over the years, I've learned how to open up around others and socialize, but I'll tell you, it's very draining and I usually have to recharge afterwards. I'm sure Jimmy and I share that trait, but unfortunately, I don't think Jimmy was ever able to fight off his bullies and overcome his own mind, and we will see the results of all those bad times soon enough. He never went out to hang out with friends, partly because there were few, and partly because he probably just didn't want to, which I understand. A neighbor would go on to say that, according to Mother Charity, quote, they were never allowed to be children. They were always men of the house because their father died at an early age. They were very responsible. End quote. Leonard Jr. and Jimmy were polar opposites. Jr. was a good athlete, strong, tall, smart, and handsome. He was a good student, and some of James's teachers, who also had Jr. as a student, would remind him of how well Jr. had performed in class. What effect would this have on a child? I can only imagine the feeling of inadequacy young Jimmy must have felt hearing this from people who are essentially strangers but play a pivotal role in growing up. We all remember our favorite teachers in school, and we all remember our least favorite. I don't think Jimmy ever had what we could consider a favorite. He lived in the shadow of his big brother. Their mother, Charity, was proud of Leonard Jr and showed her love and affection often, while expressing shame, disapproval, and contempt for young Jimmy. The constant reminders that he was never wanted, at least not as a boy, would wear on Jimmy, day in, day out. Reportedly, Jimmy battled with thoughts of suicide throughout his life, and at 16 years old, Jimmy decided that enough was enough, so he ran away from home and attempted to commit suicide by hanging himself with a bedsheet. Much like the story of his life up to that point, he failed. Perhaps, and I know this may sound dark and a bit harsh, but the world would have been better off had he succeeded. There would certainly have been eleven people who would live to potentially die a natural death, who could have gone on to do great things with their time on earth, raise families, contribute wonderful ideas for the good of mankind invent the cure for cancer, who knows? Every life that is forcibly removed from existence could possibly send the world on a different trajectory. Maybe by now we could have had free energy or a vaccine for AIDS. Perhaps one of the Rupert kids would have gone on to be president and world history would be different. It's an interesting thought that often goes through my head when I think of the victims of horrible crimes. How could the fate of the world have changed had this person been able to live their life to a natural end. It's a profound thought, at the very least. Nearing adulthood, Jimmy managed to start up a relationship with Alma Algier, which would be one of his only known girlfriends throughout his life. I wasn't able to find any information as to why the relationship fell apart, but to add salt to the wound of their breakup, Leonard Jr. would come to date and eventually marry Alma subsequently having eight children over the years. 
This was a major straw that would be added to the weight that Jimmy was carrying on his back, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. After high school, Leonard Jr. earned a degree in electrical engineering, while Jimmy flunked out of college altogether. Leonard went on to secure a good job with General Electric and planted the seeds of his future, which ultimately sprouted into home ownership, a stable marriage with Alma, a successful career at a good company, and eight children that would come along over the years, five boys and four girls, most of which were about a year or two older than the child that followed, save for the youngest, John, who was five years younger than his sister, Teresa. By all accounts, they were a well-functioning family. They had a stable father who was loving and provided well, a loving mother who was a strong grounding force and kept household affairs in tip-top order. These kids had a bright future and a good foundation for success in life. Unfortunately for these budding young ones, it would be cut short in the blink of an eye by someone they should have been able to trust. Jimmy had been unable to hold steady employment, moving from job to job over the years. As time wore on, he would develop quite a drinking habit, frequenting a local bar, the 19th Hole Cocktail Lounge, which would become a daily hangout for him. Somehow, though his financial situation was unstable at best, James had taken an interest in guns and became a bit of a collector. He would take his guns out to the banks of the Great Miami River and shoot at cans, honing his aim and control of each of his prized firearms. Jimmy had finally found something he was good at. Witnesses reported seeing him shooting cans while walking along the banks as they tumbled from each shot. He would also go to the local target range and get some practice in a controlled environment from time to time. I'm uncertain how long he had this hobby, but what I am sure of is that it must have felt good to Jimmy. This was something he excelled in, and he enjoyed it greatly. Guns appear to have a subconscious effect on those who own them. They can turn a timid, quiet pushover into someone who isn't afraid of conflict, sometimes even flipping the switch that allows their inner aggressions to spill out into the real world. Jimmy had always avoided confrontations, but at some point after his fascination with guns led to ownership, he found the guts to open up. It was no coincidence that in 1965, police learned that Jimmy was responsible for an obscene phone call made to the local public library, of which he was a regular visitor. Upon admitting responsibility, Jimmy stated to police that he thought his phone, not only at home, but in other places he frequented, such as the 19th Hole Cocktail Lounge, had been wiretapped by the FBI, and he believed they also bugged his car to track his movements. This is the only reported run-in with the law Jimmy would experience in his entire life, at least until Easter 1975. In retrospect, there are some worrying themes developing in Jimmy's life during this time. I've been fascinated with true crime stories since I was a child, and I have to tell you, this would be a big red flag to me if I were alive and knew of this at the time. Paranoia and guns simply do not mix. We'll definitely see more of those conflicting ingredients in future episodes of the podcast. At this time, he was a fairly skilled draftsman, which is, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a person whose job is to make drawings that will be used to make machines, buildings, etc. The foreman of the company that employed him in this role would go on to state that he was a well-performing employee. My understanding of why Jimmy lost this job is simply due to widespread layoffs. I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. March 29th, 1975, Jimmy's birthday. Jimmy turned 41 on this day, and as usual, he celebrated by going to his favorite local tavern. As previously stated, he was a regular patron and had actually befriended a waitress by the name of Wanda Brown. On this particular night, Jimmy drank for a while, and in an exchange with Wanda, said that he had a problem that he needed to take care of, and expressing frustration at his mother, who had threatened to evict him from her home due partly to his inability to hold employment 
his alcoholism, and the weight of monetary debt which he owed her. Both Charity and Leonard had loaned Jimmy money at various times, and these were debts that he had yet to make good on, so he left the bar for a short while and returned. When Wanda asked if he had taken care of it, Jimmy responded simply saying, not yet. This was potentially a hint at what would happen soon, but how could she have guessed what Jimmy meant? To her, Jimmy was a regular Joe, who came in to have some drinks on a nightly basis. They were well acquainted and she had never known of any inner demons that Jimmy might have battled, save for his alcoholism. Would she have ever expected to see Jimmy on the news in relation to what would be the worst instance of familiacide in the history of the United States up to that point? Jimmy would stay at the bar until closing time, 2.30 a.m., and make his way home to the comfort of his bed. March 30th, 1975, Easter Sunday. This is a day revered by Christians the world over as the day Jesus rose from the tomb and ascended to heaven. I'm not sure of the traditions around the world, but in the U.S., it's a day where families come together, often from great distances, to enjoy each other's company. It isn't unlike Thanksgiving, which is to celebrate the harvest of the season. There's usually a nice meal prepared, while the little ones hunt for brightly colored eggs and other small treats hidden around the home, park, or wherever the family gathers. Each child gets a basket to store their collected treasures in during the hunt, to be inventoried and eaten later. Along with eggs, a young girl or boy could find chocolates, lollipops, and other various sweets. I've personally found a $10 bill hidden inside one of the plastic snapped together eggs when I was little. These are memories that stay with you as you grow up, and passing this tradition down to your own children brings back that nostalgic joy of it all. This was, however, in the small city of Hamilton, Ohio, not going to be a day of fond memories. Easter started much like any other holiday. Neighbor John Spear, who lived across the street, sent his eight-year-old daughter to the Rupert house that morning. Grandma Charity told the little girl that her grandchildren would be there later for dinner. After attending mass, Leonard and Alma gathered the kids up in their family van, and as a lot of families would in those days, they made their way to Grandma's house to indulge in the wonderful meal she would cook, surrounded by loved ones. On this day, the family gathers as one to talk of good times, past times, and to tell the story of their current lives and share their hopes for the future over a great meal, with the small ones bouncing around, buzzed from consuming too much chocolate and other candies left in clever hiding spots by the Easter Bunny. These are indeed the best of times to a small child. Neighbors would report seeing the Rupert children in the yard around the home, laughing, playing, and hunting those little treasures left by a mysterious, well-wishing giant rabbit. They would say how they thought of the Rupert family as average, quiet, friendly, not in the least a standout in the neighborhood. Jimmy was known among those who lived close by as a nice man. He kept to himself, took care of his responsibilities, and was generally known as unremarkable. To his neighbors, Jimmy would certainly not be the kind of man capable of portraying the boogeyman in a horror movie. Late Afternoon According to Jimmy, it was around 4 p.m. when he arose from bed. All of Leonard and Alma's children were in the living room tallying their treats, playing and munching away, while Charity was making sloppy joes for the troop. Leonard Jr. was sitting at the kitchen table having a smoke and reading the newspaper. Alma was seated across the table, making small talk with Charity. James emerges from his bedroom and comes downstairs, groggy and hungover. He and Leonard strike up a brief conversation about the state of the stock market. The only details of the events of this day are those given by James to psychiatrists. There are no conflicting witness statements as to what would happen. The order of events has been reported in several sequences, but the gist of it is as follows. At some point during James and Leonard's conversation, Leonard would ask James, How's the Volkswagen? 
For a number of months prior, James had nagging problems with his car and had come to the conclusion that Leonard was somehow sabotaging and causing the trouble he had been having. According to James, this was a loaded question, and in his mind, a confirmation that Leonard had to be the main source of his problems. It was a problem that could easily be solved, so according to James, he didn't answer the question directly, instead stating that he was heading down to the local target range for some shooting practice. He goes upstairs to get his guns and ammo. After retrieving his 357 Magnum, two 22 caliber pistols, and what is described as an 18-shot rifle, caliber unknown, he came back downstairs. He swung the rifle off his shoulder and propped it up against the refrigerator, pulled a 22 caliber pistol, positioned himself with the kitchen sink at his back, took direct aim at Leonard and opened fire, standing only a couple feet away. He took aim next at Alma and pulled the trigger. Charity, realizing what was happening, charged at James in a futile attempt and was shot, while nephew David and niece Teresa rushed into the kitchen to see what was happening only to be shot as they made a break for the door. There was evidence that David and Teresa had almost made it through the back door, but were gunned down before they got out. Systematically, James went through the rest of the house, shooting each of the six remaining Rupert children as some of them ate candy. At some point, he later told psychiatrists, he sat down on the couch and casually took shots at the last four children. The shooting happened so fast I'm sure even the older kids were shot before they even realized what was taking place. According to James, he had shot each family member at least one time, some twice, to incapacitate them. Then he would reload his gun and go back through the scene, delivering a final shot to the head of each victim except Alma to make sure the job was finished. In an interview, Butler County Coroner Garrett Boone would say, It's unlikely that 11 people would have been shot and killed unless they were held in some way or were in a position where none of them could escape. It goes without saying that this must have been terrifying. It's haunting to imagine what the victims must have been thinking in the last few moments of their short lives. These young children were doing what most kids would be doing on this holiday with loved ones. How could anyone turn a gun on their own family, especially children, and pull the trigger? I've struggled with this question throughout my research for this episode, and I simply can't fathom how anyone could commit such a cold act. To say I'm at a loss for words is a gross understatement. In total, 31 shots would be fired, and within a span of 5 minutes or less, 11 members of the Rupert family, 8 of them ranging from 4 to 17 years old, would be dead at the hands of a small, timid, cowardly failure of a man. There were no reports of gunfire from the neighbors around the Rupert house that day. In later interviews, nearby residents would say they heard or saw nothing unusual, just the Rupert children outside hunting Easter eggs earlier that afternoon. Certainly no gunshots or indications that anything was amiss. Hours later, police would descend on the home after James placed a 911 call in which he informed the dispatcher, quote, there's been a shooting. Police arrive shortly after the call and find James waiting just inside the door. As they approached, they saw two bodies behind him in the living room. Upon entry, they find more bodies, and when all is said and done, the officers and other personnel who would enter that house would see the aftermath of this horrible shooting firsthand. The blood that had drained from the eleven bodies covered the floors, soaked the carpets, and had even dripped through the floorboards and into the basement. I have no doubt that the scene was forever burned into their memory. To this day, 44 years later, this massacre is still the worst case of familicide committed in a single private residence. Prosecutor John Holcomb would go on to say, quote, When I walked through that front door, Right into the middle of all that carnage, I saw that little four-year-old boy with blue bib corduroy overalls on, a long sleeve blue cotton shirt, and lying on the floor at the foot of the couch, stretched out with a bullet hole in his head. In his outstretched right hand, 
He had partially opened the tinfoil purple wrapper off a chocolate Easter egg. That was a sight that shook me to the depths of my soul, and I have never forgotten it. James would offer very little information to the officers, and the only quote I've been able to find from the initial questioning by officers on the scene, James explained, My mother drove me crazy by always combing my hair, talked to me like I was a baby, and tried to make me into a homosexual. Hardly worth being murdered over. James would be arrested and booked into the Butler County Jail. On April 8, 1975, Rupert pled not guilty by reason of insanity in a court hearing. A mental health evaluation was ordered for a period of 30 days, and a second hearing was held on May 13th the following month, in which Rupert was deemed sane and fit to stand trial. James's attorneys would continue to pursue an insanity defense. I mean, someone who would commit this kind of atrocity must be crazy, right? The judge declared a mistrial under the premise of James being unable to get a fair trial in Hamilton, and a new trial was ordered to take place in Finley, Ohio, a short trip south of Toledo. The new trial began, and Prosecutor John Holcomb would make a compelling case for the motive behind the massacre. You see, James's mother Charity and Leonard held saving accounts, life insurance, investments, and properties. The value of the estate James would stand to inherit upon their death was about $300,000, which, adjusted for inflation in 2019, would be a bit over $1.4 million. Prosecutor John Holcomb stated at the opening of the trial that the killings were, quote, part of a master plan with the end in view he would be sent to Lima, a state mental institution, where he would eventually be declared sane and then walk out with $300,000 in his pocket. If found guilty of murder, the inheritance would be forfeit. If he was declared not guilty by reason of insanity, all of this wealth would go directly to him, and all of his financial woes would be over once released from the hospital. He could invest, rack up interest in saving accounts and stocks. He wouldn't need to worry about employment anymore. The three-judge panel decided two to one in favor of guilt of all 11 counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for each charge. A few years later, his defense attorney, who had remained a staunch ally of James, filed an appeal revealing there had been a misunderstanding with his client. James had thought that the three-judge panel would have to come to a unanimous decision in order to secure a conviction. Yet again, a new trial was ordered, and again, James would opt for a trial via three-judge panel. James's attorney would hire the help of psychiatrists using his own money, and with their help, James would subsequently be convicted only of the murders of Charity and Leonard. For the murders of Alma and her eight children, he would be found not guilty by reason of insanity. In reality, this didn't change James's situation. On July 23, 1982, he was handed down two life sentences to be served at the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio. James would not inherit the estate of the family he murdered. At the time of this recording, James is still incarcerated and is 85 years old. That's it for episode one. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed putting it together. If you did like it, find it on Facebook and leave a thumbs up, and maybe even join the group. If you have a suggestion for an interesting case or event, head to worsethanfictionpodcast.com, go to the contact page, and leave me a message. All options are on the table at this point. Hell, even if you didn't like it, I would love to hear some feedback from you. Until you hear from me again, be safe and stay alert.